it. So um, now, today, we're going to start with a new chapter. All right? Any questions on the schedule? Exam today. I don't have it memorized, but it's right on the schedule. I feel bad for you, too. Okay. Good. Good. okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. So here we go. Okay. Good. All right, so we are going to talk today about Chapter 9, and Chapter 9 is called Articulations. And articulation, another name for that is just a joint. Articulation, it's a joint. Okay, so joints are located between two bones, where two bones come together. Wherever two bones gather, you have an articulation, right? And those articulations can be classified one of two ways. We can either classify those based on their range of motion. That means what type of motion do they do? Are they like a, um, freely movable uh, or do they not have any movement at all? So we look at those by range of motion. Uh, and then we classify also by anatomical so range of motion is how movable are they. And anatomical means what are they made of. So for instance, um, we'll, we'll go through some of those so you can see what those are like. What we really concentrate on in this chapter is the range of motion and how movable they are. They took my slide out. I can't believe they keep changing these slides. They took a slide out that I thought, thought was very useful, and they took it out. So, darn it. All right, so we're going to look at um, the joints by range of motion. So the first type of joint by range of motion is called a synarthrosis. Synarthrosis. So syn means without. So it's... Um, it has um, a very tight connection. It has no movement. That type of joint, there's no movement. Um, it can be made out of fibrous or cartilage, uh, you know, connective tissues, but it just, there's no movement. So when we think of bones like that, we think of the cranial bones where they come together at a suture, right? Those sutures, they don't move. There's no movement in between your cranial bones. The other type of joint uh, with synarthrosis that I'd like you to remember is a gomphosis. A gomphosis. So that's where your teeth, which are bone, and your jaw bone come together. Because your teeth don't move in there, right? They're nice and solid in those jaw bones. The second type, based on range of motion, is an amphiarthrosis, and this means it is a slightly movable. So that can also be fibrous or cartilaginous, meaning there's a, there's a, a connective tissue in between them. And so um, when we think of this, a good example would be the pubic symphysis. Do you remember where those two pubic bones come together? Right? You have these two pubic bones that come together, and in between them, we have a, this is a cartilage. So that's the, the pubic symphysis. We still call that an articulation because you have one pubic bone here and another pubic bone here, and they are articulating together, but there's just a little piece of cartilage in between them. Okay? And then the last type of... Um, joint by classification is called a diarthrosis, and this is the type that we're going to be studying the rest of this chapter. A diarthrosis is a freely movable joint. The majority of the joints in your body are going to be diarthroses. Another term that we give a diarthrosis is a synovial joint. And the reason why we call it a synovial joint is because those joints are encapsulated. They have a capsule surrounding them. And then lining the inside of the capsule is a synovial membrane that secretes synovial fluid. So, uh, in other words, 
if we look at, so this is just a real rough drawing of, oh, that's really bad. What does that look like? The femur! All right. Yeah. All right. And then the femur, femur is going to come into contact with that acetabulum, right? So this is a joint. It's a diarthrosis joint. And so you would have, there would be a capsule that surrounds it, right? There's going to be a capsule that kind of surrounds that whole joint. And then on the inside of that capsule would be a synovial membrane, like that. And the synovial membrane would secrete synovial fluid into that joint cavity. And so that synovial fluid, we'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes, but it helps to lubricate the joint, um, helps to keep it uh, protected a little bit, gives it a little bit of cushion. So, all right, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, let's take a look at a picture, a better picture. 9-1 is the diagram name. So on here you can actually, you can see um, the fibrous joint capsule right here. So that's on the outside, right? There's the fibrous joint capsule on the outside. And then on the inside is that synovial membrane. So that's on the inside there. So this is the knee, right? So we can see this is the femur up here, and this is the tibia down here. So that's the, that's the first thing we see is it's a diarthrosis because it has this capsule around it with this synovial membrane. So thus we call it a synovial joint. That's more common than a diarthrosis joint. There's some, other, uh, there's some other structures, some other accessory structures that these diarthrosis joints have that I want you to know. Um, not all of the joints are going to have all of the accessory structures, but these are the possible ones that you could have. So we're going to look at the knee, which has all of the accessory structures. So the first one that I want you to know is, so first here you see the bone. This is the actual femur, right? And then we have this little bit of what we call articular cartilage. And here's the tibia, and then there's the articular cartilage of the tibia. Now, you guys remember what articular cartilages are, right? They're found on the ends of the long bones. Made of? Hyaline. Hyaline cartilage, right. So they're like a remnant of that hyaline cartilage, what that bone started out as. Okay? Uh, all right, and then... Um, and then we have the joint cavity, which is just inside that synovial membrane and that joint capsule. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is going to be inside all of those diarthroses or synovial joints. And the synovial fluid, um, it, it resembles, it's very similar to uh, interstitial fluid. Remember, interstitial fluid is extracellular fluid. It's the fluid outside the cells. So um, it has a lot of uh, prostaglandins in there, and when prostaglandins are activated, they cause inflammation. So these joints can get inflamed um, you know, pretty easily with any type of injury. Those prostaglandins start producing uh, inflammation. Uh, the synovial fluid is used for lubrication, so it lubricates the surfaces of the bone and the cartilage. It's fluid in there, so it helps to distribute nutrients. And it also helps uh, as a shock absorber. You know, it's, it's like it's water. So it helps to absorb shock when you're, when you're putting a pressure in between those two bones, right? High impact. Look at some more accessory structures over here. So on this view of the knee, we can see um, here's the femur, here's the tibia. Uh, you can see the joint capsule. You can see the synovial membrane. Uh, and then there's some additional cartilage in between the articular cartilage, and that is called the meniscus. So not all synovial joints have this but the knee has it, and those are just extra pads in between the femur and the tibia. So you might have heard of a meniscal tear, you know, a tear of the meniscus, and sometimes that has to get repaired surgically. Okay. So that's the meniscus, and it again, and that's going to add as like a shock absorber too. 
in high impact when you're coming down on your um, feet. Uh, we also have in here, uh, first of all, let's look at tendons. So a tendon is a structure that attaches a muscle to a bone. So here you can see the quadriceps tendon. It's attaching the quadriceps muscle to the patella or to the kneecap. So that's a tendon. We also have a ligament. So this down here is called the patellar ligament. A ligament attaches bone to bone. So we can see the bone of the patella and the bone of the tibia. It's going from bone to bone. So patellar ligament is bone to bone and, and tendons are muscle to bone. Ligaments are bone to bone, tendons are muscle to bone. Okay. They're helping to stabilize the joint. That's what all of these uh, accessory structures are going to do. They're going to help to stabilize the joint. Now, we also have these things that are called fat pads, and the fat pads are in between a tendon or a ligament and the bone. So here we see a fat pad right here. This is a... Um, it's, it's kind of giving a little bit of cushion in between the patellar ligament and the uh, femur and the tibia. And then uh, up here we see another fat pad. So there's, there's a bunch of fat pads. Um, this particular fat pad is, um, is in between the muscle and the femur, or, and the tendon and the femur. Okay. So we do have uh, those. Then another structure that we have is called a bursa. So you see this little green thing right here. This is a bursa. Uh, it's a little sac, and it's filled with synovial fluid. So it's not in the joint capsule. It's not inside the joint. It's outside of the joint, but it's filled with uh, synovial fluid. And so when that gets uh, filled up and inflamed and irritated, what do we call that? That, yeah, that's called bursitis. Yep, exactly. So we can see there's a number of those. There's one on top of the patella, if any of you have ever landed on your kneecap, and that's swollen up. Um, there's one, there's a couple down here in between the patellar ligament and the tibia. There's one outside that patellar ligament. So they're there for cushioning as well. That's what they're doing. They're trying to cushion. They'd want to prevent friction. They don't want um, the tissues to have friction against the joint capsule. Okay, so joints, um, they're, they're, they need to be stable, but um, with joint stability, there is a relationship between how mobile a joint is and how stable a joint is. So the more mobile, the less stable. So can you guess which joint in your body is the least stable? There you go. The shoulder. The shoulder has so many ranges of motion. I mean, it can go around, it can go anterior, posterior, it can go lateral, medial, it can go internal and external, it can go round and around and circumduction. So it has a lot of motion. So it actually is the least stable. And you think about the humoral head going into that glenoid cavity, there's like it. That's it for bone-to-bone -bone articulation, and then everything else is all those accessory structures around it. Trying to So uh, when we have uh, an unstable joint, uh, we could end up with a dislocation. And a dislocation is where the articulating surfaces are completely forced out of position. So where they were together, they're completely forced out of position. It can cause damage. This is going to cause a lot of damage to those um, accessory structures. Another type of instability that's not quite as bad is called a subluxation. Still not good, but it's a partial dislocation. Okay, there's usually less damage. Maybe it popped out and then popped back. That's, people usually say, I felt it pop out, but then I popped it back in. Well, that's a subluxation. A dislocation would have to be manually put back in by a health professional, hopefully, <laughs> by health, health professional. Okay. So now we're going to look at the different types of movement that a synovial joint or a diarthrosis joint can have. And this is just a simple diagram here showing you the different types. And then we're going to get real specific. We're going to name joints, 
and then we're going to look at how to um, which joints fall under which category. Because we have six um, categories, and so here this is just showing. Um, I'm not even fond of this slide to be honest with you, um, but we're going to look at some of the motions have a gliding motion, which is a linear. That means just that one bone is gliding over the flat surface of another bone. An angular motion means that one of the bones is going to change angle on the other bone. So we'll look at some different motions with that. Circumduction is kind of an angular motion. It's where the tip stays stationary and then the uh, end of the bone is going to um, move around in a circle, and we call that circumduction. And then finally we have a rotation, and that's just where the bone, uh, the tip of the bone, the two bones are articulating, there's no angles involved, but one bone is rotating on another bone. Let's look at some different types of motions. We're going to name the motions. These you will be tested on. They're specific names. And then uh, we'll watch a little video, and then we'll all get up and try to do these motions. I'd like, you know, we'll play a little Simon Says game here. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, let's look at abduction and adduction. Abduction and adduction. Abduct. Okay, abduct with a B means to take away, right? Abduct. When, someone, when something is abducted, it is to take away, right? So that means abduction means you're moving a body limb away from the body. That's abduction with a B. And then adduction is the exact opposite where you're adding... So that's where the, the um, extremity is coming back to the body. We've got abduction with a B and adduction with two Ds. Duction, adduction. So we can do that in the legs as well. And notice that we're going laterally. It's a lateral movement out to the sides. So we can also see that that can be done in the, at the hip joint as well. Okay. Next, let's go to this one. This one's pretty common. Um, these are flexion extension and hyperextension. So this is movement in an A to P motion, an anterior to posterior motion. So it's not lateral. It's anterior to posterior. So when you're in the anatomical position, if you decrease that angle, so here's the angle here, and if you were to decrease it like that, that's called flexion when you're decreasing that angle. Bringing that, um, you can't even say bringing it forward because when you're flexing the knee, you're actually bringing it back. So it's a decrease of the angle. That's what flexion is. Extension then is where you're taking that angle and you're bringing it back to the anatomical position. That's extension. So flexion, extension. If a joint has flexion, it's going to have extension. Same as if a joint has abduction, it's going to have adduction, okay? Now, some joints that have um, flexion and extension, they can actually, um, they can extend beyond the anatomical position, and then we call that hyperextension. So we can see that that can be done in the neck, it can be done at the elbow. We're not going to get hyperextension at the elbow, though, just flexion extension, um, we can see it in the hip. You can get flexion, extension, hyperextension. You can see it in the knee. Um, you're going to get flexion and extension, but not hyperextension. I mean, you can see it in your, your fingers. There's all, we're going to look at where they all are, but they're in the, the finger joints. Um, they're in between the metacarpals and the, meta, and the carpals. They're in the ankle joint. I mean, a lot of joints do flexion extension. Most of them also can do hyper, well, no. Some of them will do hyperextension. Okay, so that's flexion extension. This is showing flexion and extension uh, and hyperextension of the wrist. So again, we had, this is the, you know, 100 degree, 80 degree angle, and then we flex it. 
and then we bring it back to anatomical position and that's extension. Then we take it beyond anatomical position and that's hyperextension. Okay. Here's um, abduction and adduction of the hand. So when we see when you're bringing all the fingers close together that's called adduction because you're adding them all together, right? And when you're spreading them apart like this, that then is called abduction. You're abducting, taking them away from each other. Here's some other motions that we need to know. We have um, rotation. Rotation. So we have head rotation here. And just turning your head to the right, that would be right rotation. Turning your head to the left, that's left rotation. You can also do that with your, with your low back. You can do um, right and left rotation. Okay. But when you're talking about things like your shoulder or your hip joint, then we're going to call that internal or external rotation. I guess it was right there. So, or, um, so here's external rotation. We can also call that lateral rotation. So when your hand is, when you are standing there and you move your hand into the anatomical position at your shoulder, you are externally rotating that humerus. So you are laterally rotating that humerus, the head of the humerus. Okay. Then if you were to bring the palm of your hand towards the back, take it posterior, now you're doing internal rotation or um, medial rotation. Okay. So we've got lateral and external or medial and internal rotation. And that's going to be, um, we're going to see that at the shoulder and at the hip. There's a special type of rotation too that is called uh, supination and pronation. And this occurs mostly at the radial head and where the radial head articulates with the ulna. Remember what that radial head looks like? It looks like a little disc at the top of the bone. And so it can pivot like this, right? It pivots. And so when you are moving your hand into the anatomical position, that's called supination. When you're putting the palm of your hand towards the back, that's called pronation. Supination. So think of your hands as being in the supine position where they're palm up, or in the prone position, where they're palm down. Okay. This is just uh, another diagram here showing supine, palm up, pronation, palm down, or palm posterior. Here's some special, other special ones here. We're going to look at um, the ankle. So the ankle joint is made up of that medial and lateral malleolus, right, the malleoli, which has the um, tibial malleolus and the fibular malleolus. They're like side by side, right? And so the talus comes right up in between them like this. And so that's the joint. It's like between the, the talus bone in your ankle and mostly the tibia, but the fibula is also in there. That lateral malleolus also helps to make it up. So um, when we look at the ankle movement, there's not a lot of lateral movement. You don't see the ankle being able to move in or out very far, but it can move a little bit because those two malleoli are just locking that talus in there and doesn't really allow a lot of lateral movement, right? But a little bit. So we have um, eversion. That is when you're moving um, the sole of the foot outward and then we have inversion, and that's where you're moving the sole of the foot inward. So whenever, you know, most people, when they get ankle sprains, they have inversion sprains. And they end up stretching these ligaments on the outside of the ankle or tearing them up. Most of the time, that's what you get is an inversion sprain. Because this is the lateral malleolus out here. It's not going to be as strong as when you evert. Um, now you've got the, uh, the medial malleolus, and that's a much stronger bone. So you tend to get more eversion or inversion brains.
Another thing that we can do at the ankle is called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion is when you are bringing your foot up. You're bringing your toes up. That movement is happening at the ankle joint in between the talus and the tibia. Plantar flexion is when you're moving your foot down towards um, the plantar surface. So when you're standing on tiptoes, right, that is plantar flexion. When you're stretching your calves and you're trying to, you know, pull on those toes, that's going to be more of dorsiflexion. When you're doing that runner stretch, dorsiflexion. Okay, so here we have the jaw. So this jaw right here, this area right here, um, you have the temporal bone, which is kind of coming down and making a little bit of a socket there. And then you also have the um, zygomatic bone, which is like there, right? So it's making a TMJ joint is what we call it. It's a temporal mandibular joint. Uh, it happens right there. It's, it's kind of, there's a little bit of a disc in between those two bones. That's where they articulate. And so you can do, um, at that joint, you can open your mouth. And when you open your mouth, you're separating. It's, it's kind of rotating the, uh, uh, not, not the temporal, not the zygomatic, the mandibular bone. So it's kind of rotating that, man, uh, that mandible in that socket. Um, that's depression when you're opening your mouth. And then when you're closing your mouth, that is called elevation. So that's the temporal mandibular joint. Okay. And then we have another thing with the jaw, which you don't see here. Um, if you, well, kind of here. So if you take your jaw and you, and you jut it outward, so if you jut it out like this, that is called protraction. And if you bring your jaw back in, that's called retraction. So I'll show you a video on these so you can see what all of those motions are. Okay, then we have with the neck, we have uh, lateral flexion. Lateral flexion is where you're bringing your ear down to your shoulder. So you would have going to the right, you'd have right lateral flexion. Going to the left, you would have left lateral flexion. And then finally, uh, we have this one. Well, there's a couple more, though. Out on this page, we have opposition. Opposition is when you are bringing your thumb, so this joint right here, between that phalange or that phalanx and that metacarpal bone. They come together to form this joint here that we're going to talk more about. Um, and that joint can move the thumb towards the pinky bone, towards your pinky finger. That is called, when you bring that in like that, that's opposition. And then when you bring it back out again, that's reposition. So opposition and then reposition. Okay. And the last one that I don't see a picture of uh, is circumduction. And so circumduction, here you have, go, how's that for art? So at the shoulder joint here, if you had your arm straight out, you could move that arm around in a wide circle. That's circumduction. You can also move it in a smaller circle. It's still circumduction. Moving your arm like this, so your this joint, this these this articulation here um, is not going to move much um, angularly, but the further you get out, the more of an angle uh, is going to be produced. So, yes, the yep, and we're going to go over. Um, so you'd have it in the humerus and then the hip. So the shoulder be the only circumduction that we have. Good question, and we're going to go over where all of these joints are. So right now, what I want to do is I just want to show you a video. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to learn the six different types of diarthroses. There's six types, and you're going to have to be able to give an example of them uh, and to describe what motions they allow. 
So you have to give an example and say what motions they allow. So quickly, we'll go over just what the six are. We have a gliding joint, a hinge joint, a pivot joint, and, oh, I see, ellipsoidal joint, which we now call condylar. <coughs> this is an old slide. We have a saddle joint, and we have a ball and socket joint. So in your notes, does it say ellipsoidal? Yeah, it does. Yep, cross it out and put condylar. Condylar. Yes? For the gliding joint, and here it says plane joint. Does, now they changed it to plane? Yeah, P-L-A-N-E. Uh, it's a gliding joint. I like it. Yep, it's a gliding joint. It just makes more sense. So on our test, it'll say plane. Or, I'm sorry. Gliding. <laughs> it'll say gliding. It will say gliding. Gliding. Right. Gliding joint. <laughs> All right, so let's look at each one of these individually then. So we have to be able to identify a, the name of the joint. You have to know how to name these joints. And so when we, most of the joints, when we name them, we're just going to use the name both of the bones. We're going to put the both of the bones names in the name of the joint because they're the ones that are articulating together. So when we say the acromioclavicular joint, where do the acromion and the clavicle come together? Right out here, right? There's the acromion, and then the clavicle is right there. So when you put your finger on that, and then you just bring your shoulder up and down, you can feel one bone gliding against the other bone. So that is an example of a gliding joint, and you would have to identify that as the acromioclavicular joint. There's another one here, though, um, the claviculosternal joint. Where is the claviculosternal joint? It's between the sternal end of the clavicle and the, the manubrium, right? So when you also bring your shoulders up, you can feel that. You can feel the clavicle gliding against the sternum. Glides against the manubrium, right? Other places where we can find the gliding joints uh, that are common are the intercarpal joints. Where do you think the intercarpal joints are? In between the carpal bones, right? So when you're doing, like moving your wrist around, circum trying to circumduct your wrist, which really doesn't circumduct, you're gliding those carpal bones against each other. That's what's happening. They're gliding against each other. Okay. So those are the ones that I think are important for you to know. If you're going into PTA, you're going to learn, you know, about like other joints like the sacroiliac joint in the back or the sacrum together with the um, ilium, uh, and there's movement there between the two bones gliding. So there's other gliding joints uh, that you'll learn about. Then we have the hinge joints. So a hinge joint is, is um, anatomically in a position where it really can only do two motions. It can do flexion and extension, that's it. This is kind of showing you what the uh, structure looks like. So you've got this kind of like a, a uh, it's a hinge joint. You know what hinges look like on the doors, right? It's hard to explain it, but it's, it's a hinge joint. That's what it actually is structurally um, formed as. And so you can only do flexion and extension with a hinge joint. So we see this in the elbow where we have the humerus and the ulna. And so we're not going to be complicated. We're just going to call that the elbow joint. Right? That's the only motion the elbow has. It doesn't have any other motion at that particular joint. right? It's just flexion and extension. It doesn't have hyperextension. That's not where pronation and supination occur because if you put your hand on your elbow on the olecranon process and supinate and pronate, you don't feel any movement there. So the only thing that actually happens at that joint where that olecranon fits into that fossa is flexion and extension, and that's it. Okay. Uh, what's another place we have that? We have that also at the knee. You can flex and extend the knee, but you're not going to be able to get any other motion there. And we also have it at the ankle joint. And remember the ankle joint, I said you have the fibula, and then you have the talus, right? So there you have the two malleoli. Um, not the talus, the, the um, tibia. So you've got the tibia on this side and the fibula on this side, and those malleoli form this nice little curve here, right? 
And then you have the talus that sits up inside there. So the talus sits up like that, that bone, that first, that big tarsal bone. And so that tarsal bone, um, your tibia, uh, tarsal bone can kind of rock on the tibia and do dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. But that's it. You don't get much, you don't get much movement there with, uh, with that joint. So, okay, so that's a hinge joint. And then the last one that is important is the interphalangeal joints. Where do you think those are? Yeah, so not your knuckles, but these are the phalanx, right? You've got three phalanx in your fingers. So if you bend, not this joint, but if you bend your fingers like that, you have the pip and the dip, proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal joints. Okay, so that is. So those are those two joints there, in between the phalanges, interphalangeal. And that's all they can do. They can flex. They can extend, but that's it. So I'm not talking about the, the joints at your um, knuckles. Not those. Take those out. Now at your thumb, there's only one joint there, so you just have, um, you know, the flexion extension with that one joint. Okay? All right, so those are hinge joints. Then we have a pivot joint. So a pivot joint is where you have one bone that's rotating on the other bone. So you probably, you're going to remember these examples. Here is um, the atlas and the axis, if you remember that. The axis had that odontoid process, and then the axis had that anterior arch. And so the odontoid uh, process sits up against that arch, and it pivots like this. Okay, well... The, actually, the C1 is going to pivot. What's going to happen? What kind of motion do you get with that? Yeah, you shake your head no with that joint, right? So that's what you're getting there. So that is called, uh, this slide is a little messed up, but it's the Atlanto axial joint. Okay? Atlanto means the atlas, atlas, axial means the axis. Atlanto axial joint. Another place we see that is in the proximal radio ulnar joint. Proximal radio ulnar. It's very descriptive. What does proximal mean? Closer to the body, right? Um, radio ulnar. So it's going to be between the radius and the ulna. And what did I say we did with that when that radius pivots? Right? We get supination, pronation with that. Okay? So two joints with a pivot joint. Then we have this next one, which is called the condylar joint. The condylar joint is a very shallow ball and socket. So it's going to have more motion than just a hinge joint or a pivot joint. It's going to have a little bit more motion. So what a ball and socket is, the, or a condylar, here you have the ball, which is the epiphyses of one bone, and then you have the socket in the other bone. Okay, so it, instead of having a big round ball like you would see in a ball and socket joint, you have sort of a flat ball going on with the condylar joint. So what this allows is it allows you to have anterior and posterior motion, and it also allows you to have right and left lateral motion. So the joints that we see this at are, here's one called the radiocarpal joint. Where do you think the radiocarpal joint is? Yeah, it's your wrist. So here's the radius, and it sits up against the, um, the carpals. You can go flexion extension with that. You can also go abduction, adduction with that. Okay, you're really not getting a, you know this motion, the supination, pronation. That's most so flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. That's what you get from that joint. So we should go back. We'll go back at the end, and we'll get a clean sheet, and we'll kind of go down which motions you can do with each one of these. All right. We're just trying to locate them for now. So here we have the next one is called a saddle joint. 
So we only have one saddle joint in the body, so you know this is going to be a test question. <laughs> it is at the first carpal metacarpal joint. Where is that? Your thumb. Okay, where on your thumb? The lower joint. Yeah, so here's your metacarpals, right? And then here's your carpal bones. So it's right here. So what does that allow? That When you move that, when you put your hand on that joint, your fingers on that joint, and you move your thumb around, can you feel that moving, right? So it is, it's a very distinct um, anatomical um, structure. What we see is, it, it, we call it a saddle joint because it actually looks like a, a horseman sitting in a saddle, right? And so what can you do in a saddle? Well, you can kind of flex, but then you've got the horn there, so you have to go up to the side. So you can kind of go flex and abduct at the same time well, that's opposition. You're flexing, okay? Bring the thumb across to the pinky, and then you can reposition. So opposition is what occurs at the first carpal metacarpal joint. Okay, and then we have the ball and socket. Now this is a very large round head that goes into a deeper socket. That's what a ball and socket is. And because of the structure, you have a lot more motion going on there. So the hip and the, and the shoulder are ball and socket joints. So in that type of joint, um, it's, we call it triaxial because there's three planes. You can get flexion extension. You can get abduction adduction. You can get circumduction. So flexion extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. So let's go back over the other ones so that you know what type of motion you can get with each one. The type of motion that you get with a gliding joint is just gliding. That's all you get, gliding. One bone gliding against another. With the hinge joint, the only motions you're going to get here are flexion and extension. Um, yep, just flexion extension. With the pivot joint, you're going to get a special type of rotation. With a condylar joint, you get a little more motion. You're going to get flexion extension, abduction, and adduction. With a saddle joint, the type of motion that you can get here is called opposition or reposition. Opposition, reposition. And then, of course, we have the ball and socket. And here we've got lots of range of motion, flexion extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. So this has the most amount. It can actually go in three different planes to provide those movements. So on the test, on the, on the lecture exam, you're going to be asked questions about, you know, where would you find uh, this joint? What type of movement would this joint create? Uh, what type of diarthrosis joint is this? So you, you have to be able to identify those. I suggest in lab you actually look at some. I'll have you look at them on Wednesday. We'll, we'll look at I'll have you go through the skeleton and just pick out where these joints are so you can see them and then actually move the bones and see what type of motion they can actually do. So for the lab exam, there are some ligaments that you have to know and a couple of tendons that you have to know. Uh, we're not going to be going over the elbow or the hip. So the only joint, or the uh, elbow or the hip, I think are the two, or the spine. So we're not doing the elbow, the hip, or the spine. We're going to do the two commonly, most commonly injured ones, the shoulder and the knee. So we have two models in our lab, and you have to go through those models and look at these um, ligaments. So let me show you. We'll start with the shoulder. This is a diagram that might be on your lab exam. Okay, on here, if we look at the bones, we're looking at ligaments, so we want to know where the bones are. We have the clavicle, so this is the acromion process out here. 
You're, that's the acromion out process out there. Um, and then we have the scapula, and the scapula has the acromion, so we've got the acromial end of the clavicle, and then we have the acromion process, or the acromion, okay? Acromial end of the clavicle and the acromion, which is part of the scapula. The ligament in between those two bones is the acromioclavicular ligament. Acromioclavicular ligament. It's the name of the ligament that goes between those two structures. Now we have another structure down here that is called the coracoid process. So this too is coming off of the scapula, but it's the coracoid process. And so there's um, two ligaments that are coming, you can see three here, um, but two different names of ligaments coming from the coracoid process. So whenever a ligament comes from the coracoid process, you want to start with the name corico. Okay, it's coming from the coracoid, start with corico. So this ligament, these two ligaments here, are extending from the coracoid to the clavicle. We call those the coracoclavicular ligaments. And then this ligament here is going from the coracoid to the acromion, so we call that coracoacromial ligament. Coracoacromial ligament. You're going to see this. Um, I might have this diagram, but I also have a shoulder model. So you want to make sure you get yourself oriented with that model so you know where the clavicle is, where the acromion is, where the coracoid process is. That's the first thing you have to do. Yep. Is there a way to tell where it originates from? So, so it they don't originate where? really like muscles do. You know, so muscles, we, we usually say they originate either medial or um, proximal. Um, but we don't, we, we don't usually, yeah, no. So just remember that if, if it's um, from the coracoid, coraco comes first. So if it touches the coracoid. Yep. Okay. And this one you can, this other one up here, this is the AC joint, so it's the AC ligament. I don't know if you've heard of people that damage their AC joint, so the AC ligament. So if you just remember that, then you can go, oh yeah, clavicular. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, then this is another, this is a ligament that we have on this, uh, a diagram that we have. On this diagram, the humerus has been taken out, and all you're seeing here, this is the glenoid cavity in here, okay? And then um, we see that here's the, uh, the capsule around it, okay? Um, some of you may have damaged your labrum before. That, that's a little lip on that glenoid cavity, that just makes that just a little bit deeper because you know that glenoid cavity is not deep at all. So it just makes it a little bit deeper for that humoral head to sit in. Um, and so then on this picture, there's two ligaments that are outside of the capsule. And so where you see these folds right here, they're going to be underneath those folds. So this one right here is called the glenohumeral ligament because it's coming from the glenoid cavity and it's going to go to the humerus. So that would be the glenohumeral ligament, and you'd find it right there on that diagram. It's outside of the capsule. It's outside the because it has to attach to the actual glenoid cavity. So it's outside. The um, and the other one that we have on here, oh, is up here. This one is coming from the um, the coracoid process again. It's right here, but it's been cut. So it's coming from the coracoid process, and then we cut it because it's going to the, um, the humerus. So we would call that the coracohumeral ligament. So it's right here is the name that's all squished for some reason when I bring these over. Coracohumeral, and it's this ligament right here. It's going from the coracoid process and then it would attach to the humerus, but we cut the humerus out. Right, then look at the knee. So this is looking at the front of the knee, and here's the patella, the kneecap. Right above the kneecap, we have the quadriceps tendon that's coming from the quadriceps muscle and, and attaching to the patella. Down below, we have the patellar ligament, and that's a ligament, so it's going from bone to bone. It's going from the patella to the tibia. Okay. 
And then um, on the side of the joint, we have two, we have collateral ligaments. So there's the fibular collateral ligament and the tibial collateral ligament. So collateral. Co meaning two, they're cooperative. Ligament. Um, lateral meaning they're on the side. So this is the, um, one of them, this is called the lateral collateral. I mean, that's how the docs are going to call it. They're going to call it the lateral collateral or LCL. On here, you see it called the fibular collateral because it's telling you it's the ligament from the fibula to the tibia, or to the femur, from the fibula to the femur. But docs are still going to call it the LCL or the lateral collateral ligament. And then on the medial side, remember the tibia is on the medial side. On the medial side, we have the tibial collateral ligament. And most of the time here, docs are going to call it the MCL or the medial collateral ligament. Medial collateral ligament. Okay, so when football players, they get hit from the side, boom, like that. Their knee is going to bend this way and this way, the two bones, and then this MCL will tear because of the strain, right? So that's the MCL. Now let's look a little deeper. Go to the actual bones. Now I do have a diag I have models too on the knee, so I'll probably be using models. So when we look at this, now we've taken off the patella, so we no longer have the kneecap, and we're looking inside the joint. We can still see the, there's the LCL right there, and we can see the MCL on this side, but now we're looking into the joint. So first we look at those uh, little pieces of cartilage that are in there that are called the meniscus. So we've got two, we have got a lateral and a medial meniscus. Here's the lateral meniscus. How do we know it's lateral? There's the fibula. The fibula is lateral. It's on the outside, right? Here's the medial meniscus. How do we know it's medial? Because it's the tibia over there, right? There's, there's uh, the fibula is on the outside, tibia is on the inside. So that's the medial um, or uh, medial meniscus, the medial meniscus. Then if we look deep into the joint, we see these two ligaments that crisscross. One goes this way, and then the other one goes this way. Okay, so those are called a crisscross, like a cross. So we call those the cruciate ligaments. Cruciate, because cruciate means cross. Cruciate, they cross inside. We call it the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligaments, the ACL and the LCL. ACL is the one that we hear about all the time, getting torn, right? So um, how we know these, how do we know which one to name them? It's where does it attach on the tibia? So this one right here, that one starts on the front of the tibia. This is the tibial tuberosity right down here. So this is on the anterior side of the tibia, and then it crosses and goes to the back of the knee. So that would be the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. Then if we look at the posterior view, we can see the PCL better on this one. So here we have those crisscrossing ligaments again. Okay, and um, we see this one right here. And look at it, it's attaching here to the back side or the posterior side of the tibia. So this one is going to be called the PCL because it's attached to the back of the tibia. It goes to the front of the femur. Now we don't want to mix that up. This, this out here is the, um, this is that lateral meniscus. Remember, we know it's lateral because this is the fibula on this side, so that's lateral. And we can see some of the fibers of the, of the um, lateral meniscus are going up into the joint. So don't confuse that with the PCL. Because you're going to see that on the model. So don't confuse that. Questions? Lots of anatomy here. All right, we're done.